Hi guys, James at Rampant Lion Reviews again for you today with another beer review. For this one, we are going to stick to Scotland and we're going to return to a brewery that's featured on the channel many times before. I've had some really nice beers from these guys over the years, a good few different styles, and if people were to ask me about this brewery, I would say that back in the day, this brewery were known for their kind of pale ales, West Coast IPAs, sessionable beers really, but in recent times they've been doing some really bold, big and interesting beers, quite a few different styles that I wouldn't have thought this brewery would ever do, but it's been really interesting to see that and some of the ones that we've tried so far have been really, really nice. But the beer we're going to have a look at today is a style that I haven't tried from this brewery yet. It's a kind of sub-style as well that you don't find all that often in Scotland, or you didn't at least find in Scotland until very recently. So this one, I think, could make for a very interesting review. So needless to say, I'm really curious to see what this one is going to have in store for us. Hopefully it's another good beer. Hopefully it makes for an interesting review, and as always, I hope that you guys watching enjoy my take on this one as well. So, uh, yeah, for this review then, we are going to head over to Dumbarton, which is a little bit to the north of Glasgow, to the west of me here in Clipmanshire in central Scotland, and that means that we're going to have a look at yet another beer from Loch Lomond Brewery. So, this particular beer is called A Crack in the Clouds. It comes in at 10% ABV, and this one, I guess we should say, is an Imperial Fruited Sour Beer. But it's a blueberry and blackcurrant sour, according to the can, and this one was another beer that I bought at the cellar in, uh, over in Dollar. A recommendation from Craig, who works there, who really knows his stuff when it comes to Loch Lomond Brew and Overtone too. So, uh, yeah, this just kind of caught my eye because it was an Imperial Sour and as I say, you don't find too many of these in Scotland, actually. I'm, I've no idea whether it's going to be more like a kind of smoothie sour, a keto sour, or exactly what it's going to be. But, yeah, this, this just kind of caught my eye. I liked the name. I know Loch Lomond Brewery are going to give me something pretty solid. So I just kind of thought, well, why not? But, yeah, let's crack on then and see how we get on with this one. A crack in the clouds, a 10% blueberry and blackcurrant sour beer from Loch Lomond Brewery over in Dumbarton. So... As always with my reviews then, I'll tell you a little bit about the brewery before we taste the beer. If you want to get straight to the tasting though, just fast forward. All the usual links can be found in the video description below. That's the brewery website that links to my other reviews that I've done from Loch Lomond Brewery before and we will no doubt add more to that list at some point in the near future. But there's all the usual social media down there. If you want to see more reviews, do please consider subscribing to the channel. The support that you give is massively appreciated and remember you can and go into the channel homepage and search for beer using the geography tagging system. So just go in there, use the little search bar, put in your hometown, state, county, whatever you like. If a review beers from the area that you search for, they will pop up. Failing that though, you can check out the playlist of beers from different countries. You'll find this one in the Scottish playlist along with a number of other things and we will be continuing to add to that as time goes on and you can check out the playlist of beers from other countries as well. But yeah, let's go on to my brewery notes then and I'll tell you once again about Loch Lomond Brewery. So, Loch Lomond Brewery, as I've told you before, was opened by Fiona and Ewan McKeechan in Alexandria at the southern end of Loch Lomond back in 2011. So, the couple had been home brewers for a number of years, but they decided they wanted to turn their profession into their job, and they saw a gap in the market in Scotland for cask ale, and they'd also witnessed the growth of a number of other breweries in the country over the last few years, and they thought, well, let's go for it and let's do it, and it went pretty well for them. So the first brewery that they had was located in the Loch Lomond or Lomond Industrial Estate in Alexandria and they gradually scaled up this facility over the years. But uh, in 2018 they rebranded and they moved into a new facility in Dumbarton in late 2019 and this facility is equipped with a 35 hectolitre brewery and at this point they also hired a new brewer called Thomas McGregor who had previously worked for Black Wolf Brewery in Throsk just outside of Stirling. They were of course originally called traditional Scottish ales and then he also worked for Meantime Brewery down in London as well. But this leaves Ewan uh, more time to focus on helping build the business which he's done quite successfully over the last few years 
And of course, you can see the change in brewing mentality from Rock Bowman in recent times too. Like I said, back in the day, these guys were really known for uh, more kind of sessionable beers like pale ales and stuff like this. Uh, one of my favourite beers from these guys was the Silky Stout, which was really good. Uh, but in recent times, of course, they've been doing these bigger, bolder, more American style beers, I guess we could call them. And they do currently have plans to move into a larger facility of the Flamingo Land Resort that's going to be developed in Loch Lomond. I haven't heard anything about this for a wee while. That whole development was going, uh, all that was in the works before the COVID-19 pandemic and things of course got put on hold at then. But I know it is quite controversial amongst the, the locals up there. So I've really no idea what's actually going to come of that one. But yeah, Loch Lomond do want to scale up and have a restaurant and a, and a tap room and things like this. So we'll just need to see how that develops over the next little while. But as of July 2023, when I'm filming this review for you, these guys have produced 130 different kinds of beer according to Untapped. And uh, yeah, like I say, they do a whole range of different beer styles these days. We've tried a few different pale ales and IPAs and things from them in recent times, but I've noticed over the last year or so, year or two, they've been doing some really big high alcohol bold beers which have been interesting to see. They did their 10 beers for 10 years series and we've been reviewing a few of those as well which were very very good. But yeah that is everything I can really tell you about Loch Lomond Brewery for the moment. If you want to learn more about these guys you can of course check out the brewery website, you can follow them on Facebook and Instagram to keep up to date with all the latest goings on and you can check out the Rate Beer Untapped and Beer Advocate pages to learn a little bit more about all the different beers that these guys have done. So yeah, let's go on then and actually have a little look at this beer itself. So as we mentioned earlier, this one comes in at 10% ABV. It's a blueberry and blackcurrant sour. We have to term this one an imperial sour because of the strength and it is called a crack in the clouds, which I have to say is really nice. I do love the artwork on this one actually. I love, you know, I studied chemistry and physics. I love pretty colors. I love big explosions and stuff like that. It was great. Um, so yeah, the artwork on this one is very, very nice. But there you can see the Loch Lomond Brewery symbol. Plain silver top on the can there. Incidentally, this one is a 440ml can. And I think I paid about £6 or something for this. Maybe a little bit less than that. I think about 5 actually uh, in the cellar along in uh, along in dollars so it was for what it is i think it was pretty good value because sour beers usually are a little bit more expensive because you have to have a, a kind of separate brewery and things like that for them to make sure you don't get infections and so on and especially when it's an imperial sour too and a fruited one at that but yeah scotland is of course famous for its berries so i'm guessing it will be local berries that have been used in this one i don't think they um have a little look at the untapped page i don't think it said anything about that no it didn't so yeah we'll get rid of that and we can actually have a look at the beer itself as i say so a crack in the clouds 10 percent imperial blueberry and blackberry sour from loch Lomond brewery uh let's get this guy out into the glass and see what it's all about i'm really curious to see what uh, this beer is going to have in store for us i think this is actually my first sour beer from loch Lomond brewery if i'm not mistaken but yeah, I'm curious to see exactly what kind of uh, style and substyle this beer is uh, is going to be. So um, anyway, you can see that this beer has poured really very nicely. Um, does it say on the ingredients list? Yeah, this one's got uh, bar. It's got wheat in it as well. So it's maybe going to be. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be quite a smoothie sour or something, but it might be like an imperial Berliner Weisse or something daft like that. But uh, yeah, it looks very nice. So before the head disappears on this beer, we can see that it poured with between a half and a two-third finger of a frothy, uh, I would say kind of pink tinted creamy head. You can see some medium bubbles sticking, uh, you know, sitting at the top of the liquid there and it gets a little bit more foamy the further up the head that you go and it's a little bit bumpy too but you can see that the uh, you can see that the, the head is just fading away to back in a nice thin foamy there on the top at 11% ABV you'd kind of expect that but you can see the ring is just sitting there around the, uh, the edge of the glass one or two big bubbles sticking toward the side of the glass there too and a few little ones just going up toward the bottom of the head but not too much in the way a visible carbonation. Now when it comes to the colour of this beer, if we shine the light through it, it's got a lovely kind of like candy apple red type colour to it. That's really how I would describe it, it's kind of candy apple red. 
and I'm just surprised actually because you know when you think about blueberries and blackberries and stuff you would expect the colour just to be that little bit darker when you think about the, the berries but you know in beers they do come out pretty red so that's a little bit of a surprise with this one but remember the colour of your beer depends on a few different things one the type of malts that you use this goes a long way to determining your EBC rating Two, length of your wort ball is also going to play a role because the longer you boil the wort, the more the sugars caramelise and thus you get a darker colour of beer. But any barrel ageing that you do or adjuncts that you put into the beer will affect its colour too. And that's quite clearly the case with this one, as it often is with uh, many modern sour beers. And we're seeing sour beers gaining in popularity in Scotland because of the likes of uh, Vault City and uh, and Holy Goat. And, you know, several breweries are starting to do more and more of these now. Loch Lomond, obviously. Tempest did a few, but nowhere near as often uh, as they now do. Uh, oh, who else has done some sour beers? Uh, Brewdog, of course, have the, the overworks. Uh, and, you know, Dead End Brew Machine seem to be focused on the more kind of funky sour side of things too. But yeah, in terms of the appearance of this beer, I think it's lovely. Good little bit of kind of hazy character to it as well, and that will be due to the wheat in this one. But appearance-wise, as I say, the colour of this one for me, I would have expected it to be a little bit kind of darker than it is, rather than a candy apple red. But yeah, I'm not surprised it's got this lovely kind of bright colour to it. But yeah, I think that's everything we really need to say about the appearance of this one. We can have a closer look at the aroma and just see how we get on. I'm very, very curious about this. Ooh, that does smell very nice. I have to say that, that's a beautiful, beautiful smelling beer. Now, it kind of gives you everything you'd expect. Um, it's almost like... Um, it smells to me like a mix of a, a, a sort of kettle sour and also like one of these more modern Berliner Weisse Goza type things. It's kind of somewhere in the middle, um, but the aroma is very nice. So you've got a bit of bready base to this one. You've got the juicy fruits, uh, the tartness of the berries and just a little bit of more kind of complex character to this one as well. Now I'm curious about this beer as to whether it contains hops because it does have a little bit of a green component to it. Uh, but we'll need to judge that a little bit later on. We'll talk about that later. But let's just have a wee closer look at the aroma then and try and break it down for you and describe it for you a wee bit more in depth. But the aroma is very nice. As I've said before, for me, many of these sour beers are very straightforward in terms of their aroma and flavour profile. But if they're done right, they can be beautiful beers. And, you know, Loch Lomond have shown quite a bit of prowess in recent times with the stuff they've been putting out there. So, um, yeah, let's... Uh, just break this one down and uh, describe it for you that little bit more in depth. So, for me, um, this one's just lovely. Um, stylistically speaking, I think it, it has a little bit of that Bellina Vaisa type quality to it, but like an Imperial Bellina Vaisa, it's quite strong. A little bit of smoothie character in there, and yeah, it has everything. So, I mean, the backbone of this beer, there's a little bit of like a, a white bready... Uh, bread crust coming out of this one you can definitely smell that um teeny little bit of woodiness in there um but yeah um yeah white bready bread crust teeny little bit of woodiness but you do get quite a little bit of a fluffy white bready character coming out of this beer to be honest with you that really is interesting but then above that you start to get a more kind of yogurty petit filou type note and this is why I say that the beer has an element of smoothie sour character to it. It definitely, now it doesn't have oats in it. That's a little bit surprising for me. So um, it kind of goes to show you how big a role the yeast and the actual fruit additions and things uh, make to the beer. But yeah, above the white bready character, there's definitely a little bit of a kind of yogurty, you know, petit filou, munch bunch type thing. Munch bunch yogurts, of course, are the little ones that you give kids here in Scotland. My mum used to put those in my lunchbox when I was younger. But it reminds me of the strawberry and raspberry um, ones that I used to get when I was wee. And there's a little bit of that yogurty character to the beer. On top of that, you do get a little touch of sweetness. There's a little bit of like a Werther's original butter candy, butterscotchy type thing going on in the malt base too. But yeah, I think it's fairly straightforward. A little bit of bread, a little bit of wood, uh, bread crust underneath the course, a kind of yogurty, fromage free, petit filou type thing. And then above that, you get this little bit of almost creaminess and 
a kind of Werther's original butter candy, butterscotchy sort of thing. Uh, the aroma that you get out of this beer is uh, is absolutely lovely. It gets a gets a big thumbs up from me. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I think uh, I think that is pretty damn awesome. <laughs> so, um, yeah, for me, the I don't know if there's really much else we need to say about the malty side of the beer. Now, when it comes to sour beers like this, uh, one of the key things to think about is what you're going to do in terms of hops. So what they did back in the day in Belgium with um, you know Hoises and uh, the Flanders Reds and things like that was they used older hops that uh, had lost a little bit of their alpha acid potency so that you still got the hoppy flavours but then the bitterness didn't detract from the sourness of the beer. But there are many modern sour beer breweries who don't use hops in their beers because they say there's no need to. And whenever you put fruit into a beer as an adjunct, it tends to kind of suppress a little bit of the green component anyway. So there is a little bit of a debate about using hops and it giving you a depth of flavour and not using hops and uh, you know bringing out the fruit a little bit more it just depends what you want to do Scottish breweries tend to use a little bit of hops in my experience you know Vault City, Holy Goat whereas uh, Swedish breweries like Elm Eleven, Duck Pond, Fermenterna just as an example don't uh, don't use hops so just it really depends what you want to do in terms of the um, the aroma that's coming out of this beer I wonder if they have used a, l a little bit of hop in this one because you do still get a wee bit of green component to the beer but again that can be placebo uh, in my experience but yeah I get a little bit of I do get a teeny little bit of earthiness and a bit of herbal character out of it there is a touch of like floral and grassy character to this one too it does not have hops listed on as uh, an ingredient in this one but it certainly does um, give me a little bit it does give me a little bit of that uh, floral grassy sort of thing and just a wee bit of earthiness it's almost got a little bit of like a brambly woody sort of note to it as well which I often find in these uh, types of sour beers especially Scottish ones my grand and grandpa always had brambles in their garden and we used to eat the, the blackberries that we got off those um, but yeah it does smell really nice in that regard it has a bit of that brambly woody sort of thing and a bit of floral grassy component and of course the fruits are what you'd expect, it's blueberries and black currants, they're giving you quite a little bit of tartness at the front of the nose. But yeah, behind that you've got some nice kind of, um, you do have some nice juicy figgy character coming out of the beer. Um, you've got a little bit of candied strawberry of course, uh, yeah, so candied strawberry, a little bit of fig, we touch a raisiny sharpness. But yeah, a lot of blueberry and blackberry sort of character. Uh, which you would expect going by uh, what's on the can. But yeah, um, for me, it does. the beer really does smell a little bit like a kind of um, Imperial Bellina Weisse um, type thing. It really has that, that kind of vibe to it. So I'm curious to see whether that's reflected in the flavour or if it's going to be completely different. But as I say, you do get a, a very simple, kind of straightforward aroma from this one, but that's quite often the case with these beers. They're very straightforward in terms of flavour and aroma profile, but um, they just, uh, they, they're just really nicely done beers if they're done well. So yeah, let's uh, leave it at that for the aroma. As I always say though, take a bit of time to ponder over that aroma, but I think we should taste this one now and see what it's all about. So this one is called A Crack in the Clouds, a 10% Blueberry and Blackberry Imperial Sour Beer from Loch Lomond Brewery in Dumbarton to the north of Glasgow over on the Scottish West Coast. Let's get stuck into this. Slange, Skoll, cheers. Yeah, that's pretty damn nice. Um, I'm going to say straight away, this is the first sour beer that I've had from Loch Lomond. Um, and if I don't know how many they've done. I know this is quite a popular one. Um, but if this is one of their first attempts at sour beers, I have to say it's pretty damn good, actually. Um, so if they played around with this style more, they really could be on to something. If that's a one of the first sour beers they produced that's impressive so yeah but this is a really nice beer i will say in terms of the sourness and things this thing has a this will give you a kick in the balls for sure uh, when you take the first uh, 
the first sip of that. This has a hell of a tart impact to it, but it mellows out really quite nicely. And it does hide its alcohol really quite well. What I was saying earlier um, from the aroma about it being kind of... Um, yeah, what I was saying about it uh, from the aroma seeming like a kind of Bellino, a mix of a kettle sour and a Bellino Vice type thing, that holds up in the... Uh, that absolutely holds up in terms of the, the flavour with this one. Um, I think it's great, it really is. Uh, very, very nice in that sense, and it gets a big thumbs up from me. Um, yeah, I like that. I really do like that with this beer. Um, yeah, let's let's break this one down and describe the flavour for you a wee bit more in depth, as we always do. So, middle third of your palate then. The backbone of the beer, you have that lovely kind of soft, like white bready bread crust backbone there. It's like a fresh hedgehog roll. So you can feel that forming the backbone of your beer. Uh, as you move further forward on that middle third of your tongue, you get a little touch of woodiness coming out of the beer. And that gets a little bit more prominent the further into the aftertaste that you go in. It almost feels as if it has a little bit of a vanilla type quality sitting on top of it. But yeah, um, above that, you have this really creamy, you have this kind of quite dense and smooth white bready character sitting there. So yeah, you have this kind of smooth, dense, um, yeah this big smooth, dense bready character there sitting above the kind of bread crusty layer and you can feel the wheat in there kind of it's the wheat on top of that bready layer is giving you a very smooth bready character so as i say this beer is interesting because stylistically it has the sharpness and tartness of say a kettle sour but the malty base is a little bit more akin to a kind of berlina weisse actually um and uh I, I like I do like that about this one. So yeah, um, above the kind of bready character in this one and the wheaty character, you do get a little hint of a slightly yogurty creaminess to the beer, which is a little bit akin to a smoothie one. But th th this beer is definitely not a smoothie sour. No way, no way. It is very much like an imperial Berliner Weisse with a little bit of kettle sour sharpness to it. That's probably a very fair way to describe this. So as I say, you have a lovely, uh, dense white bready character topped off by a very smooth wheat. Then there's a little bit of a kind of yogurty, a very slight yogurty creaminess just sitting on top of that. Yeah, and the kind of yogurty characteristics that come out of this one are very much akin to. Um, the yogurty characteristics that come out of this one are very akin to a kind of, um, I would say, um, it's, it is very much like a kind of petty filou, like a fromage free, you know, like a strawberry, raspberry type yogurt. It really is kind of like that in the middle of your palate, but potentially in the dead centre of your tongue, above that yogurty note, you do get a little touch of a kind of Werther's original butter candy, butterscotchy sort of thing. But that takes a wee bit of time to come out. But as I say, the malty side of this beer is obviously not meant to be the focus. It's uh, it's quite a straightforward middle third of the palate in this one. So, yeah, I think we've said everything we need to about that. Let's look at the back third of the palate then. And as I've said, quite often, um, the back third of your palate will give you a similar flavour profile to the middle third of your palate. It, the flavours will just come out at different intensities. But do remember that general trend with beer, that the further forward on the palate you go, the sweeter the flavours will be, the further back you go, the more bitter they'll be. Um, so, yeah. In that border region between middle and back third of your palate, you do get a nice little bit of bready build-up in there. There's a wee bit of a kind of bread-crusty character 
uh, as well. Like a, a, you get a little bit of the kind of brown bready character I was meaning, sorry, in the base there. And as you move further up, it gives you a wee bit more of a white bready sort of thing. But yeah, on the back third of the palette, you get the bread crust there, which feels a little bit kind of more dry. There's almost a little slight touch of a kind of crackery layer there. Then above that, a wee bit of a wholemeal brown bready character, a bit lighter and more airy, and the fluffier white bread just uh, sitting above that too. And yeah, above all of the, above all of that um, white bready character, you can feel a little bit of the wheaty you note know, just kind of creeping over the top, and it gives you this lovely sort of smoothness uh, above everything else on the malty part of that back third of your palate. But above all of that, you start to get the kind of, um, you start to get the yeasty um, side of the beer, which is. Uh, which is interesting. So the yeasty side of the beer for me is quite. Um, it's uh, the yeasty side is quite interesting. It's not overly prominent. This one it takes a wee bit of time for the yeasty character to come out of the beer into the aftertaste, but it has a little bit of this like it's like a soft mix of brown and white bread. Um, it's got a wee bit of like honeycomb to it as well. I always get honeycomb for some reason on that. Uh, back third of the palate. So you can feel the, the kind of yeasty character sitting above the wheaty side of things. Lovely kind of, yeah, it has that lovely um, mix of things. But yeah, it's like a denser white brown bready character, a little bit of honeycomb matched around it. And uh, yeah, it goes together really nicely. But yeah, you can see the uh, the back third of the palate, the flavour is definitely taller than as you come further forward into the middle third of your tongue. It just kind of condenses down and squashes together that little bit more but it's uh, it's lovely stuff actually I do like how the malt base goes together in this one as I say very much like a Bellina Weisse with just a little tiny touch of uh, very slight touch of smoothie sour character to it very very minimal but yeah this beer it's maybe like 10% smoothie sour 60% or so uh, no yeah 70% Berlin of Ice and then about 30% uh, does that add up? yeah 30 yeah 10% 10, 10 smoothie sour 30% uh, kettle sour and then like 60% Berlin of Ice it's really very much like that uh, but yeah um, I think that covers everything we need to say about the malty and yeasty side of the beer on to the green component then the hoppy side of things if that does indeed exist I think just by the feeling of the side of the palate of this and I think they haven't added hops into this beer but yeah let's look at it so the back corners of your palate then, you do have a very slight earthiness to the beer. And as you move further forward from that, it gives you a little bit of herbal character. But as you move along the sides of the palate, you can feel it does get very, very smooth. And you get a little touch of floral character at the front corners of the palate there, which is nice. And uh, yeah, a little bit of a lighter grassiness just around the edge of the tongue too. But I, as I say, you do have this slightly kind of woody smoothness along the sides of your palate too, which is very much like a kind of brambly sort of thing. You quite often get this in beers that have um, certain types of berries added to them. I don't think, just there's not a big bitterness to this beer, but Bellina Vices uh, and sour beers generally are not high bitterness beers. I don't think just from the, the feel of this beer... I don't think there's been hops added into this one. I'd be very curious to know though if they have put a little bit of like, you know, Haller Tower sats or something like that in there just to give it a bit more depth. But yeah, I suspect this beer doesn't have the um, that kind of side of things going on. So. Yeah, I think that covers the green one, but you do get a wee bit of that grassy placebo sort of thing there with this one uh, but yeah let's look at the front third of your palate then and the fruity side of the beer so the border region between front third and middle third of your palate you get a nice little bit of a kind of bready build up in there a wee bit of brown bread in the base a little bit of white bread on top and you've got the base of that um, yeah you do have the base of that kind of front third of your palate there which gives you there's a wee bit of bread crust there's a wholemeal brown bready sort of thing and a white bready character and then above that you get the the fruity notes and the fruity character it doesn't really seem oily in a sense it actually seems quite juicy and I think that kind of tells you again that's another sign that there's not hops uh, in this beer but you can feel the fruitiness kind of spreading around the edge 
of the the power there too, which is a sign that you know adjuncts have been put into it as well. It's a little bit. I think the blueberries are giving you the majority of the sharpness in this one, and the blackberries are giving you uh, a bit more of the juicy character in a sense. But it's blueberry and, and blackberries. When you put them together, if you put like for example blueberries and black currants you'd get a little bit more oily character out of them. I always found that currants are a bit more oily in their flavour than berries. But yeah, the front part of your tongue, above the malty side of things, you might get a little hint of like a candied strawberry, like an oily candied strawberry, but then all that blackcurrant blackberry sharpness comes in there. And the impact flavour of this beer is really quite sharp, actually. Yeah. The impact flavour of this is... Um, is really pretty big um, but what the more that you drink of this one the more it mellows out and you start to get more of the maltiness and the sweetness coming out into the aftertaste but yeah the I think the blueberry is giving you most of the the they're both giving you a bit of juiciness but yeah behind that very front tip of your tongue you can really feel that sharp tart impact coming out of the beer and I think it works really well and you can feel the wetness of the fruit just spreading around the edges of the palate and suppressing what there would be of a green component anyway but um, yeah it's a lovely beer this one I think this is really nicely done and if this is one of their first kind of sour beers that they've done they should play with this a little bit more and see what else they can do because um, yeah they've got a really nice malty base and this one it covers its alcohol very well too um, it, it takes you a few sips of this one to realise just how boozy it is, but yeah, I think uh, uh, flavour and aroma wise, this is this is pretty nice. Um, so it gets, it gets my approval. I'd be very curious to see what else Loch Lomond do in this style category going forward. But um, yeah, I think at that point we can move on and have a talk about the mouthfeel. So yeah, for me, this beer, it's. Um, Yeah, for me, it, it does have a good little bit of body to it. I mean, it's one of the heavier sour beers that I've come across in recent times. It has, a, and generally speaking, I'd say this is kind of top end of mid-bodied. Really smooth carbonation. It has that typical kind of Scottish cleanliness to it because of the water. I've talked about Scottish water on the channel many times before. But for a sour beer, the malty base in this one is big and heavy, but it's 10%. You should kind of expect that. It does lean quite a little bit toward the sort of Bellina Vaisa type category for me. It doesn't have the saltiness that you would expect of the Goza. Both of those, of course, are German style uh, sour beers, but the Goza has that little bit of salt added to it. But uh, yeah, it is, as I say, this beer for me is about 30% keto sour, 60% Bellina Vaisa, and then 10% smoothie sour. It has that. I think that's. To describe it stylistically, that is fair. The malty base, as we said, it's a bit of dryness underneath, a bit of smoothness there, a tiny little bit of sweetness and creaminess on top. Um, very little in the way of IBUs. This, I think this beer, technically speaking, will be zero IBU, but you've probably got about five or something silly like that coming in. But it has a hell of a tart impact to it. Really sharp tart uh, note coming out of it and lovely kind of berry qualities too. But um, yeah, lovely, lovely beer this one. And it does get a, a, a big thumbs up from me. Um, yeah, really cool to try my first sour beer from Loch Lomond Brewery, if, if I'm not mistaken, of course. And I've enjoyed this one. I'm going to go away and enjoy the rest of this with my dad. He loves berry sours as well. But, uh, you know, this is, a can, this is definitely a can for sharing, as a number of the Loch Lomond beers that I've had in recent times have been. Uh, the Loch Lomond big beers, when they go big, they do go big. So um, if you buy something that's you know north of 10 percent with these guys plan to share it with a friend don't try and tackle it yourself as good as the beer is it is it is quite pretty difficult but uh yeah um this is nice uh, uh the fruity character this one big sharp impact when you take it and it's uh it is a really nicely done beer this and it gets a big thumbs up from me wouldn't hesitate to drink it again but another 404 milliliter can would be pretty difficult so uh, yeah, I think we can leave it there. So this one was called A Crack in the Clouds, uh, a 10% blueberry and blackberry sour from Loch Lomond Brewery in Dumbarton to the north of Glasgow here in Scotland. Once again, thank you for watching my beer reviews. Until the next time, please like, subscribe, share, all the usual YouTube stuff. Let me know your own thoughts on this beer in the comment section below. Let me know what your favourite beers are from Loch Lomond Brewery as well. And we will see if it returning to these guys again. 
at some point in the very near future. But until then, slam chip, skull, cheers, check out my social media, check out Loch Lomond Brewery social media, and we'll see what else we can find from these guys. I do have an Imperial Stout and a Barley Wine Stout to look at from them, so you'll see those reviews very, very shortly. Slam chip, skull, cheers, and see you guys very, very soon. Check out some Loch Lomond Brewery beers if you get the chance.